As mentioned, I was asked to talk about uh, terrorism, the quote war on terrorism, and uh, organizing resistance to it, so I'll do that. Uh, I prefer discussion to lecture. How many of you are familiar with ZNet? Hands up if you are. Under those circumstances, there's even more referent, more reason to prefer discussion to uh, presentation because you probably have already heard and read most of what I have to, to say. Um, nonetheless, I'll do what I was asked for, but I will try and do it relatively rapidly. Uh, what happened on September 11th, I don't know, most of you probably like me, I was, well, a little bit different. I was working away at the computer on uh, ZNet, and uh, Lydia called me and said, you got to come in here, and I did, and we watched. Um, and we saw the buildings go down, and we saw them go down, and we saw them go down, and we saw them go down. And we saw the media do something that was quite interesting, I thought. They looked at a calamity, and they gave the human dimensions of it. This is not all bad. That is to say, the media looked into this horrible occurrence, this attack which killed many, many, many people, and it gave the human dimensions of the suffering. They demonstrated that they were capable of doing that. Now, what's wrong with that is not that they did it. What's wrong with it is that Iraq has suffered the equivalent of a September 11th every week for about 10 years, in some total, and they haven't done it once. So the capacity to, to reach in and understand the human and social and, and just you know, direct day-to-day -day dimensions of a horrible event exists in American media. Keep that in mind as we go forward. So it happened. We could talk about the motive of whoever planned it. On September 12th, I was suggesting that I thought it was very likely that bin Laden was um, in some way or another connected with what went on. I still think it is. Um, let's assume it for the sake of the discussion. We don't know it for sure. I suspect that the motives had zero to do with um, American culture, zero to do with American freedom, zero to do with anything American. Uh, they had to do with a desire to uh, change regimes in the Mideast, to try and draw the United States into behavior that would destabilize regimes in the Mideast. We could ask about why the people who did it, did it. There's another interesting thing that is often not talked about. The people who were in those planes were here for probably a year or two. You know, in, in, like in World War II, when the Japanese pilots engaged in kamikaze flights, which is basically the, the same idea um, at another point in history, they were nurtured by a community that would rev them up and that would, that would get them into a mindset to be able to do this. I don't think ever in modern history, probably never in history, has anyone gone off, lived in a hostile environment, isolated from everybody who thinks like they do, and engaged in, in sort of undercover development of their ties in the community for a couple of years and then gone off and done something like this. Yeah, I mean, the, the level of discipline and, and commitment to a cause, to a particular act, whatever we think about that act, is truly mind-boggling, I think. Um, and so we have to ask, what, was, what motivated the people who did it? I suspect there, unlike the people who planned it, there was the motivations connected to injustice, connected to oppression, connected to trying to fight back. There's a way to know that. When bin Laden gives a speech, he talks about that stuff. He talks about the United States in Iraq. He talks about the Palestinians. He talks about, why does he do that? Well, because that's what he needs to say to galvanize support for the agendas that he has. Just like the United States, the President of the United States talks about freedom and justice instead of talking about oppressing people to galvanize support for what he's doing. It's quite comparable. Bin Laden had no concern at all for the Palestinian people. Bin Laden had no concern at all for people who are suffering and poor around the world. Anybody who had concern and was in a position to think would realize that the acts undertaken would hurt such people, not benefit them, as we see it doing all around the globe. Um, what makes the acts despicable? An attack on civilians for political purposes. That is indeed the definition of terrorism. An attack on civilians for political purposes. I think that's despicable. What happened since September 11th? Well, the first thing that happened is the United States told Pakistan to close the border to Afghanistan. What does that mean? Afghanistan is a country in which the average uh, 
uh, uh, lifespan is in the mid-40s, in which one-third of the population is literate, in which the country was suffering a tremendous crisis for food, and in which uh, it was re recovering, not really recovering, it was coming out of a, a decade-long war. In that context, the United States told Pakistan to close the borders in order to interrupt the flow of food. Aid workers around the world, Christian aid, UN aid agencies, basically all the aid organizations that were concerned with providing food to the Afghan population immediately and universally, without a single dissent, said, if you even talk about bombing, much less if you bomb, it will disrupt the flow of food into Afghanistan. Disrupting the flow of food into Afghanistan for any extended period of time going into the winter is likely to kill millions of people. Nobody, any place in the world, contested this prognosis. That's very important to understand. Nobody said, that's false. Nobody in the US government said it. Nobody else said it any place. Why? Because it was the best estimate, it was the best prediction of what the implications would be of engaging in bombing. So the first thing we did is tell them to close the border. The second thing we did, we being the United States, is, I don't know, they met in the Pentagon or whatever, and then we started bombing. We bombed rubble into dust. We bombed Afghanistan with everything short of nuclear weapons. We bombed knowing and believing that what we were doing was going to, or could, kill millions of people. There was no expectation on Rumsfeld's part that it would end quickly. The expectation was that it would go through the whole winter. So the United States was engaging in a set of actions that could kill millions. Immediately after September 11th, in the US Congress, some bills came back on the floor. Military spending bills that had been voted down were reintroduced to be voted up. Uh, repressive bills that you're all aware of that would never have stood a chance were pushed through. These are the things that happened. Now let's ask what was going on in the mindset or the minds of US elites. What were the motivations at stake? Well, the buildings were knocked down. Something had to be done. Why? We'll see in a second. The first thing, basically, we're considering our policy. And there were certain constraints on what the US could do. The first constraint was delegitimate international law. Why? Because if we legitimate international law, it is applicable to us. Because if we strengthen international law, it could be brought to bear on our acts in Iraq, on the fact that we've been waging chemical and biological warfare, that is, withholding food and medicines, chemical and biological warfare, against the population of Iraq to the, to the tune of a million corpses. It could be used against that. It could be used against US policy in various places around the world. So it is necessary from our point of view, from the US point of view, whatever we do with regard to this terrorist attack, and it was a terrorist attack in New York City, whatever we do, we have to delegitimate rather than legitimate international law. This is why when the Taliban said, give us evidence that bin Laden was responsible and we will send him out, we will export him. The United States didn't even think about providing evidence. Whether they have it or not, they would not provide it. Because to provide it would say, we have to do that. It is incumbent upon us to offer evidence. But the United States position is that we have to do nothing. Nothing is incumbent upon us. We do whatever we want, and everybody has to relate the way we say they have to relate. And the last thing we want to do is legitimate the notion that we are subject to any norms outside of Washington, D.C. and, and uh, Wall Street. The second constraint was admitted. It was said out front. We have to maintain credibility, was the formulation. What does maintain credibility mean? Well, suppose one of you were to borrow some money from the mafia and be late in your payment. What would the mafia do? They would send somebody to collect. Suppose you refuse to pay. They'd break your legs, right? Uh, suppose they liked you. Your friends, they'd break your legs anyway. Why? Because they have to maintain credibility. What does it mean? It means they, they can't establish the principle, establish the idea that it is okay to cross and to violate them. 
They have to maintain credibility. If you can come up with some other explanation for what maintain credibility means in the question and answer period, I'd like to hear it. That's what I think it means. It's a technical term, an obfuscatory, a lying term to, to, to label the, the intention of, of saying to the world, again, we are a thug and we will do whatever is necessary when we are crossed and it will never be abrogated, we will always do it. We have to maintain credibility. The third constraint wasn't actually a constraint, it was an opportunity. September 11th was a, 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 a huge, as gross as it is to think in these terms, a huge opportunity for US elites. Because it said to them, look, you can reinvigorate something that you pursued in the past, that Bush Sr. and Reagan tried to do. They tried to, to re-engineer American foreign policy around the idea of a war on terrorism. The terrorist network, the international terrorist cabal, this was all, this is not new. This was part of an effort by Reagan and then Bush to, to provide a logic for American foreign policy. What had been the prior logic? The Cold War. The Cold War was what was used, with the Soviet Union, was what was used as the organizing principle of American foreign policy. Not the actual organizing principle. The actual organizing principle is, of course, to extend and enhance American U.S. geopolitical and economic interests. That's what's really behind U.S. foreign policy. But what's needed is something to tell the American people. You can't go on TV and say to the American people, we are supporting the Contras in Nicaragua. We are supporting a bunch of bloodthirsty thugs who are running around the countryside killing people and raping people. And the reason we are doing this is because we don't want the Nicaraguans to use the resources that are under the ground in Nicaragua and the energies of the people of Nicaragua on behalf of populations in Nicaragua. Rather, we want those resources and assets to be utilized for the advantage of people in the United States, elites and corporate elites in the United States. You can't get on TV and say that. If, if Bush or Bush Sr. or Reagan or anybody else gets on TV and says that, it doesn't fly. It's gross. It is immoral. It is all the things that would arouse passionate opposition. So instead, you get on TV and you say, in the case of the Contras, we are going to support the Contras in order to induce freedom in Nicaragua and to oppose and to thwart the, 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 the vile plans of the Great Bear of the Soviet Union to come into the United States through Nicaragua by way of Texas. So the Cold War provided an organizing principle to do what? To scare the population, to, 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 to coerce the American population into doing things, into supporting things, or at least not opposing things that otherwise would have been impossible. And that's what Reagan and Bush Sr. were trying to do when they tried to create the ethos of an international terror network to provide a new way to scare the U.S. population, and it didn't work. And Bush Jr., using September 11th, is now in, in, embarked on the same thing, and thus we have the war on terrorism, which is supposed to last a decade or five decades or whatever. Well, the first notable thing about the war on terrorism is that it isn't the war. The United States doesn't fight wars. The last war the United States fought was in Vietnam. The United States fights massacres, right? They're inaptly called wars. It is not a war when one side loses five people because a helicopter crashes and the other side has its entire country bombed into dust. This is not a war, it's a massacre. It is just, a, it's a shooting gallery. We do not fight with people who can fight back, right? We engage in massacres. So the war on terrorism is really a massacre on terrorism. The second problem with the name is that it doesn't have anything to do with terrorism. If we were trying to so to reduce terrorism, we would not be engaging in terrorism on a massive scale. Remember what the definition of terrorism was? Attacking civilians for political purposes. So just exactly what were we doing when we bombed the country of Afghanistan? We were bombing civilians throughout the country of Afghanistan, potentially starving millions of them to death for political purposes. What are we doing when we withhold uh, uh, food and medicine from Iraq. The same thing, attacking civilians for political purposes. So we are the world's major engager in and supporter of terrorism.
We wouldn't be doing that if we were trying to reduce terrorism. We also wouldn't be creating worse conditions. That is, feeding the conditions that induce people to be so desperate that they would engage in something like a, you know, knocking down a building with an airplane. We wouldn't be further, we would be trying to reduce those conditions. So it's not a war and it's not about reducing terrorism. It is instead an effort to, to find an organizing principle that can scare the American public, that can, 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 can confuse the American public, that can anger the American public, and publics throughout the world, in other countries as well, in ways that will, will, will cause them to either give in to passively or even support policies that we would otherwise not even have put up with. That's the purpose. So that's the, the, the logic and the dynamic that's associated with what's occurred. Now, during the events, I, I mentioned the, the aid workers explaining and, 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 and requesting uh, that we not bomb, that we not talk about bombing, and then we bombed. And then the aid workers basically got down on their knees and they begged us to stop. Again, because of worry that it would cause millions of deaths. Now, the interesting point about this is that the Associated Press, the news bureau in the United States, goes out and sends reporters around the world. Now, they didn't do a great job. They didn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the Zenet type content coming over the Associated Press wires. But the Associated Press stories did report what the aid workers, what the health workers, what the various agencies that were responsible for the, basically, the, the survival of Afghanistan were saying. And, and those stories went in front of every editor of every newspaper in the United States. And every editor and every newspaper in the United States decided that those stories were, if not entirely unfit to print, at most should appear in the 19th paragraph of a story appearing on page 87. They didn't on the front page put a headline, Bush about to bomb Afghanistan risk two million lives to delegitimate international law and prove that we have credibility as a thug. That was not the headline, right? But, but even short of that, they didn't put any reference to, to the fact that everybody agreed that what we were doing was engaging in an act that could kill two million civilians. Think about that. Think about the, 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 the system and the mindsets and the pressures that are associated with people literally just, the New York Times says we print all the news that's fit to print. They mean exactly what they say. We print all the news that's consistent with the reproduction of the social relations and the economic relations that we believe ought to persist in the United States. Right, that are consistent with our authority and power and our wealth and that of people like us. The rest, we do not print or we print infinitesimally at a, at, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner which 98% of the population will be unaware of, at most. This is pretty striking. In 35 years, I don't remember a clearer case of, of uh, the, the narrowness and the, the vileness of the role of American media. And there have been plenty that are pretty horrific, but this one was, was a bit amazing. But just so we can put in proportion who these people are and what they think, um, suppose you were bin Laden, and I said to you, bin baby, I don't know what I would say, bin, how do you refer, bin? How could you conceive and execute, let's assume you did, how could you conceive and execute an attack on these buildings, given the cost? I think bin Laden would say back something like, well, cost was great, but given the goals that I had, we could talk about that, but given the goals that I had, I thought that what could be gained outweighed this cost. And so I pursued this course of action. Now assume that you're Bush and Rumsfeld, and I ask the same question. How could you guys sit around, plan to bomb a country from rubble to dust? with the possibility of the tremendous human cost that would, that would follow. I think you would not understand the question. And it's not because you're stupid, although 
One of you is. That is, Bush is stupid, I suppose. But, it, but that's not the reason, because Rumsfeld isn't stupid. The, the reason that they would not understand the question is because they do not understand that there was a human cost. When they sat around in the, in the Pentagon and discussed what to do with full presence of the kinds of reports and predictions that I described, I don't think that they spent a day, I don't think they spent hours, an hour, 10 minutes, a minute, 20 seconds, a millisecond, discussing the plight of the people who would be under the bombs and who would be starving. For them, it isn't a cost. It's like you don't think about the fact that you might step on a, you know, an ant on the way out of this building. It, the lives of Afghans simply do not count as a human or social cost. There was nothing to calculate. If hell existed, and if it had layers, and bin Laden was in the third sub-basement, you'd need a fast elevator to get down to where Bush and Rumsfeld are. <laughs> what should have been the US response to September 11th? Well, why don't we ask what should be the British response to people in Boston providing aid and sustenance to the IRA engaging in, in bombings in London? Or why don't we ask what should be the response of people all over Latin America to the United States having a school widely known that trains the terrorists who go down there and engage in terrorism and torture? What should their response be? What should the response of Iraq be to the United States engaging in chemical and biological warfare against Iraq? If we think that the response of these countries should be to engage in massive assaults upon the American population, then I suppose, consistently, we might think that it made sense for the United States to attack Afghans' population. But I don't think so. I think what makes sense is to go to the world court, it's to go to institutions that exist, it's to make a case, it's to organize opposition, it's to create a dynamic which brings it to a halt and which prosecutes the perpetrators, not whole populations. That's what the United States should have done. But of course, that's inconsistent with delegitimating international law. It is inconsistent with maintaining credibility. And it has nothing to do with engaging and embarking upon a war on terrorism. So it wasn't even considered. Um, what are the prospects? Well, well, what should we be doing? It seems to me that what we should be doing is building movements of opposition in order to put constraints on, reverse, and eventually change foreign policy. Constraints on the war on terrorism, reverse the war on terrorism, change foreign policy, and ultimately change the institutions of our society. We should talk about this in the discussion period, but very briefly, how do you win anything? You win anything by raising social costs so high that the people who are in the position to, to make the change have no choice but to do so. During the war in Vietnam, Elites in the United States were engaged in this barbaric assault upon Indochina. Why? To further their interests. To further the interests, the geopolitical interests and the economic interests of the United States. To prevent a good example. That is, to prevent a country from extricating itself from the US imperial system and demonstrating to other countries, A, that it could be done, and B, that life would be infinitely better if you did it. That's a bad precedent. That's an example we didn't want. So it was necessary for us to present that good example that others might emulate and that others might therefore attain for themselves, thus reducing our role in the world and basically undoing the network or the empire that we had. So we wanted to prevent it. So American elites favored a war in Vietnam. During the course of the war in Vietnam, if you go back and you look at the, at the reporting, you'll see that over time people changed their minds. And not just us, not just people who dissented, but elites. Many elite figures came out against the war. When they came out against the war, they would hold a press conference like this with 200 mics, and they would explain why they have come out against the war. And they wouldn't say, um, I have been morally repulsed by our behavior in Vietnam. I've decided that you know, for us to drop plastic toys into the trees in Vietnam for the kids to grab, which blow up and send plastic shrapnel into the children, 
plastic so that the Vietnamese can't find it, so that it will tax their infrastructure. I have decided that, it, that our doing that and our killing millions of Vietnamese, that this is just morally outrageous and I can no longer support it. No one said that. No American elite said that, with, with one or two exceptions. The, they didn't say even I've decided that the deaths of American GIs are a horrendous price to pay. For them, American GIs are just chattel, right? They're, they're one tiny step above Afghan civilians. Nobody said that. What they said was rather essentially this. Our streets are in turmoil. The fabric of our society is being torn asunder. The next generation is being lost to us. In good conscience, I can no longer support the war. What were they saying? They were saying, I'm engaging in this war, I'm supporting this war to enhance and enlarge my economic and geopolitical uh, agenda, my interests. But the war's effect on people in the United States is creating a movement which is threatening my economic and geopolitical interests. And it's gotten to the point where the threat has exceeded the benefit and I no longer in good conscience can support the war, meaning in my own interest, in the interests of my sectors of the population, I now think it is time to stop this thing before the movements get even bigger and begin to threaten my corporation, my capital, my everything. That's the way that one wins change, by raising costs that coerce the results that we desire. That's the logic. It is not... It is not complicated. You don't have to read 18 volumes in arcane language to understand this. There's nothing complicated about it at all. And what does it say to us? Well, it says to us that if we want to reverse wars, if we want to win a stoplight, the social costs we have to raise aren't that high. If we want to win a higher wage, much higher costs, but still not astronomical. If we want to stop a war, if we want to get rid of the IMF, the World Bank and the World Trade Organization, much less if we want to change American infrastructure, we have to raise huge costs. That means we have to have large movements. Large movements. Not small militant movements, large militant movements. The small militant movement raises no costs at all. A movement that stays the same size, it doesn't matter how militant it gets. It is not raising costs. A movement that grows, that threatens a trajectory, that says to them, the streets are in turmoil, the next generation is lost, business as usual is impossible. That's a movement that is raising costs that begins to turn their heads. That's the kind of movement we need to build. So, so, and, and these are among the things that we should talk about in discussion. I, I, I want to end so that we have some time for that. What are our prospects? Well, the first thing is, is that I think the war on terrorism, the massacre on behalf of elite policies, more properly called, um, but the vernacular, the war on terrorism, is, a, is an inconsistent and unwise policy from their point of view. It's not surprising that they tried to seize the time, to use a, an expression of the left. They tried to seize the moment that, that September 11th offered. But there is something intrinsically weak about using the idea of a war on terrorism as an organizing principle of American foreign policy. And this is what it is. When they used um, uh, the Cold War, the enemy being communism, when a president got up and said, um, you know, I am pursuing policy X in Nicaragua or wherever, uh, because of the, the threat and the danger of communism, he and communism were not the same thing. He and communism were very different. And when he invoked the threat of communism, he was invoking something that did not reflect badly on him, right? It was at least consistent, if not honest. When Bush gets up and says, I am engaging in an attack on Iraq in, in, in the, um, the, 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 the increasing uh, repressive reform of law in the United States, in the export of troops into the Philippines or Indonesia, in, in whatever the next steps are, because of terrorism, he has a problem. Because terrorism is attacking civilians for political purposes, and that's what Bush does. And so he's invoking that our policy should be done because something is horrible, which he does. And I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to see this. And that over a certain period of time, people understand it. So, 
immediately after uh, the bombing started, well, actually a little while after the bombing started, one of the computers at, at, um, at our operation, actually we work out of our house, and at our house, broke down and we had to have somebody over to fix it. And we called and the guy came. The guy who came was about 28 or so, white guy, married, um, had his own business. He was the owner of this small business. So this is the archetype um, a supporter of the, the rightward drift in the United States, ostensibly. This guy listens to Rush Limbaugh, also listens to NPR, doesn't boast for amusement. Um, Rush Limbaugh is entertaining, he said. Anyway, so he's there fixing the computers, and I start to describe exactly the kinds of things that I've described to you. In the same terms, probably more emotional because of the times, um, I explain about delegitimating international law. He has no trouble understanding this whatsoever. Um, I explain about maintaining credibility, using the mafia, no problem. I explain about the war, no problem. I explain about the hunger, about the motivations and everything else, and he's weeping, literally, crying. Uh, but when the whole thing is finished, he says to me, Michael, you have to understand something, I don't want to hear this from you. My wife doesn't want to hear this from you. My friends don't want to hear this from you. My parents don't want to hear this from you. And I say to him, you mean like you don't want somebody to describe to you the pain and suffering of an earthquake? And he says to me, exactly. Now, you might not have all gotten the analogy, but he got it immediately. What he was saying was, and he now said it explicitly, I can't do anything. I can't impact it. It is a fact of life. It's the way the world is. It is just reality. I have to try and make my situation, the situation of my wife, the situation of my kids, the situation of my friends better. For me to concern myself and to worry about this simply detracts from that to no good. I was recently in Brazil for the World Social Forum. Um, it was a massive event. We went from venue to venue by cab. You had to. Um, that meant taking lots and lots of cabs. During the course of that, we asked every cab driver, it was like a controlled experiment, the same question over and over again. You may not know too much about Brazil, but very briefly in Brazil, there's something called the Workers' Party, the PT. Lula runs. He's going to run in October, I think it is, for president again. This is a very, very, very progressive force. Um, call it social democratic if you want. Call it left if you want. It isn't entirely clear. It is so far to the left of any significant social um, um, manifestation in the world um, that it is very, very important. We asked each cab driver, uh, what do you think of the PT? Nothing much. What do you think of voting? Don't do it. What do you think of Lula? I like him. He's a really good guy. I, I sort of trust him and respect him. Lula is a very impressive working class organizer who's running for president. Are you going to vote for Lula? No. Why? The most eloquent response was, because we're dust blowing in the wind. In other words, because it doesn't matter. Because poverty, indignity, subordination are like gravity. They're like aging. They're a fact of life. Don't whine about it. Get on with things. That's the biggest obstacle, I think, to organizing the scale and reach and strength of movement that we need, whether we're talking about Brazil or the United States or pretty much other places in the world. It's a feeling that oppression is bad, sure. We keep telling people how bad it is. They know. They know. The poor know that poverty is painful. The, the people who suffer racism know that racism is undignified and degrading. The people who get raped and beaten know that that's horrible. 30 years ago, when we explained these things, when movements explained and surfaced these things, it was actually a revelation, which is why the new left swelled up as it did. But it's no longer a revelation. Now everybody knows. What people don't believe is that there's any alternative. So when I talk about prospects, I have to suggest that our prospects depend on two very important things, three things. One is, conveying alternatives, conveying a convincing, compelling vision, not just of a short-term program, but of what we really want as an alternative. Why not just a short-term program? 
Because for 30 years, we have, 35 years, we've been telling people capitalism is this powerful system. It emanates forces that contour and impact all sides of life. Ditto for patriarchy, ditto for racism, ditto for authoritarianism. These structures are powerful. They control and rein in any efforts at change. They, they subvert efforts to make things better. And you know what? People believe us. People have, have, have learned this lesson. And they think that, just to give one example, globalization, they think that, you know, if you guys were to win, if you guys were to replace the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, with new international organizations, which instead of being devoted to tilting the playing field on behalf of the rich and powerful, were devoted to tilting the playing field on behalf of the poor and weak, and that's actually what the anti-globalization movement is about, precisely. If you were to do that, you know what? The economy of the United States would still be the same as it was before, and the economy of Britain, and the economy of India, and South Africa, and Australia, and on and on. And the forces from all those economies, which produced the IMF, and the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization before, would be operative again. And slowly but surely, they would undo what you did. That's actually not wrong. That's correct. If you're not moving forward, you're going to move backward. If we win changes, and they are not moving forward toward new and larger changes, towards ever greater changes, towards systemic change, then they will be moving backward toward the old relations. So what we have to do is provide a vision of where we're going and a compelling picture of the process by which fighting for and winning changes reforms, like an end to a war, that's a reform, a, an end to the IMF, that's a reform, a shorter work week, that's a reform, affirmative action, that's a reform, a, a, a picture, an image, an understanding of how fighting for those things can be done in a way which leaves us more empowered after we do it, which leaves us structurally stronger after we do it, and which leaves us desiring and in a position to win still more instead of rolling back to where we came from, and which tells where we're going. When we achieve those two things, we will be two-thirds of the way, I think, toward having the basis for movements that can really turn around the planet. The third problem, the third problem is one I usually talk about a whole array of problems. Um, I, the megaphone problem. We only reach people who are looking for us. We need a bigger megaphone. We need to have a media policy. That's one of them. There are others. But the one that of late has seemed to me to be most overwhelming in its magnitude is the following. One day I asked myself, not that long ago, I was at, actually I was at an event like this, I was speaking, somebody was talking about stuff, somebody said something which caused me, sitting on the panel, to think in this direction. I, th I thought to myself, how many people in the last 30 years have been in the vicinity of the left? By that I mean, how many people have been in a movement, anti-war, women's movement, gay and lesbian movement, labor movement, no nukes movement, mid-east, anything, any progressive or left movement, or been in a class for a whole semester with a radical or a revolutionary or otherwise been in the vicinity of the left, um, in some way engaged with the left. And I decided that 10 million was a, was a really conservative number. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know, the left is supposed to be the good guys. We're supposed to have better morals. We're supposed to care about one another. We're supposed to be the repository of the future, the, 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 the place from which uh, sympathy and empathy and caring and solidarity emerges in society. So shouldn't it be the case that if you come into the vicinity of the left, you are attracted ever more strongly to it, that it's desirable, that it's appealing, that it is fulfilling, that it is empowering. Shouldn't it be the case, therefore, that people who come into the vicinity of it become more strongly engaged with it, more and more committed, more and more conscious, more and more involved? That should seem to me to characterize a healthy, powerful, growing, effective left. Really, it should characterize any left. But if 10 million people over the last 35 years have come into the vicinity of the left, and if the great bulk of them were made ever more firmly involved in the left and committed to the left, and if they were outreaching to others, then by this time, we would probably have a left with 40 or 50 million people in the United States. 
And at that point, I almost fell off my chair on the stage. Because I realized that the stickiness problem, which is what I call it, the, f the fact that we aren't sticky, that the left, instead of attracting people, like gravitationally and having them stick, almost repulses people. The fact that we aren't sticky is responsible for the fact that right now we have, instead of 40 million people, whatever we do have. And just think of what it would be, what the world would be, and how many lives would be saved, and how many souls would be brighter if we had an American left with 40 million people right now. This is my generation's fault, I'm sad to say. But the problem is, and the third component, third key component among others, is to build a movement which actually makes people feel better, stronger, more committed, rather than wanting to leave. Um, we can talk about this in the discussion period. The essence of it is simple. We say to people, come join us. Risk your relations with your parents. Risk your relations with some friends. Uh, risk your future job. No longer enjoy television. No longer enjoy movies. No longer um, be able to conduct yourself freely and in a relaxed fashion because everybody's going to criticize everything that you do. Uh, um, you may well have a less emotional engagements, less, less deep friendships than before. It's distinctly possible. Come join us. And what will we give you for all of that? Long meetings and backbiting. And a set of standards by which you feel that every time you try and do something, you fail. And we wonder why we're not growing. We need to rethink what it means to create a left that is sticky and that grows and that can raise social costs capable of changing society uh, in the short run and in the long run. And I think if we do those things, uh, we will be in very good shape. I think that the shape where, you know, there's a lot of people who like to look back and not find problems. I like to look back and at the present and find huge numbers of problems. If we look and we see no problems, we're in very deep trouble. The next generation is not going to be genetically superior to my generation. They're not going to be smarter. It's not going to be more courageous. It's either going to do things better or it's going to do things the same and do no better. So it has to be possible to do things better. So I need to be able to go back and look at what my generation did and what has been done since and find flaws. And we need to not wallow in those flaws but correct them. The big flaws that I see is a lack of attention to vision, a lack of willingness to try and sit down and answer the question, what do you want, which virtually everybody asks. A lack of attention to strategy, to developing a picture of how change comes about that's compelling and convincing. And a lack of attention to our own needs, to creating a movement that, that sustains and keeps us. And uh, if we can deal with those three things, then I think the war on terrorism is doomed and so is capitalism. Thank you.